The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, robotics webinar from TAPS. My name is John Skies, and I am the media director here at TAPS. I'm joined today by Vina Williams, the uh, TAPS Fine Arts Director, and Brian Bunzelmeyer, who's the TAPS Executive Director, and Andrew Schutze, who is uh, the statewide organizer, organizer for First Tech Challenge. A um, few things about today's webinar before we get started. If at any point you have a question, go ahead and put that in the questions box that you're going to see in the GoToWebinar control panel. We're going to keep an eye on that as we go through today. If we can answer it as we go, we will. If not, we will hold it till the question session, um, question section at the end of the session. Um, and also this uh, webinar is being recorded. So if you registered through GoToWebinar, you will get an email uh, this afternoon or tomorrow that will have a link to the recording so you can refer back to this information. We're also gonna put it on our YouTube channel so that uh, anybody else um, at your campus or um, anybody at other schools that you know who wasn't able to access this material, they'll be able to review it there. We're gonna put links to everything on the TAPS website under the robotics page. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Vina. Thanks, John. Welcome to Apps Robotics Coaches. Thank you for joining us today. Andrew's going to take a um, talk to you about what FIRST is and what FIRST Tech Challenge is. And then at the end, I'll talk about what our TAPS Championship is all about. So uh, welcome, Andrew. Let's hear about FIRST. All right. Uh, thank you, Vina. And so, um, yes, I organize uh, First Tech Challenge uh, across the state of Texas. I have uh, colleagues of mine or peers of mine in uh, different positions uh, in Houston, Dallas, Lubbock, El Paso, Rio Grande Valley, who helped me organize. Uh, they do all the things locally in their area. Uh, I help manage things here in the central Texas, which is kind of like Waco uh, down to Corpus area. And then um, my day-to-day -day, uh, job is uh, working here at Lutheran High School of San Antonio as a science and technology instructor and robotics coach. And so um, FIRST is a, an acronym starting, standing for the Foundation for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And it's a continuum of four programs that you see there on the slides. And so it was started early 90s uh, by maybe the person you know, uh, Dean Kamen, prolific inventor, uh, made lots and lots of medical devices and sold them. Um, maybe you know of him more likely because he invented the Segway, but he's done things been recently like Luke Arm, uh, water distillation things for third world areas and things like that. But what FIRST is really about is changing the culture and they do that through their four programs. And so. Uh, we're going to primarily talk about first tech challenge today, but understand if if you've got a feeder pattern or you're a K-12 program, you can implement that all the way across the way. It starts with kindergarten through third with the first leg of league junior, fourth through eighth grade, first leg of league, first tech challenge kind of splits uh, some of the middle school or junior high. You could have seventh or eighth graders working on your team. Uh, but it is primarily a high school program. And then the first robotics competition, we won't talk about much today. Uh, that is a high school program, uh, but the robots are bigger and more expensive. So let's, let's go on. And so this is kind of talking about um, what FIRST is trying to do. And um, really first is not about training kids to be uh, robot people, right? Um, it is really changing about the culture. And that's why you see on the slide there, a transformative movement. It's getting kids uh, around the robot, sort of the campfire is kind of in the lingo and get them to be engaging on a very exciting project, bringing in outside mentors and things like that and making them ready, not only for the, the, the workforce that we're gonna need, but also making them change makers. We'll kind of get into that some more as well. So next. Um, so uh, big numbers, right? Uh, it is not just here in Texas, it's all over North uh, America. It's down in Central and South America. It's, it's all over the globe, uh, a lot of that. 
is through the first Lego League program, but it's growing also with the first Tech Challenge. And these things are, are not run uh, by a, just a handful of people as a statewide organizer and things like that. Um, most of my job is trying to beat down the path and try and find volunteers. And there are many people that get involved in that way. And the number on the lower left, take a look at that. $80 million plus. Um, these are scholarships uh, for students who have been participants in First Tech Challenges uh, or First Robotics programs that many universities, professional organizations find that these students that are doing these kinds of things in high school are going to make great students in college and great uh, professionals in the workplace. And so they are supporting that not only by uh, in, in kind with volunteer hours or uh, financially with helping us run events and underwrite, but also by providing uh, paying it forward and, and giving scholarships. So that's something um, that you want to look at uh, as well as, you know, uh, you know, why would you not engage in a program where now your kids are going to be in uh, an opportunity where they could possibly earn scholarship money? Uh, let's keep going. And so let's uh, look at some of the impact statements that are coming up here. And so we'll go to the next slide. Um, and so where does all this come from? Uh, first, it's been around since the early 90s when Dean Kamen first created this thing and it's, and it's evolved and grown. And over time, they've had uh, several different uh, third-party funders who have paid for um, longitudinal, multi-year case studies following participants. Uh, these were not run in-house. They were actually run by researchers at Brandeis University. So third-party money, third-party researchers involved. And so what you're seeing there on the slide are just some of the high-level um, things is that the students involved in this program are more likely going to go on to STEM or STEM careers or even understand STEM if they're not working that. Um, the things that they are learning uh, persist. Their, their knowledge is not like one-time flash in the pan. And um, lower right, take a look at that one. It's over double of getting girls or women, young ladies, start moving into STEM careers and in STEM careers outside of what you traditionally might think of where women are, are well represented or less underrepresented and it not only works for women this is also uh, working for other underrepresented groups in STEM and so um, we'll get a taste of that of something that we're doing here at Lutheran High School as well later um, when we have a couple or more folks joining on the presenting side so let's go next and so Yep, you can check that box that that involvement in this program is kind of there again, uh, two and a half times double that they're going to go into engineering or into some sort of STEM field. And then on the right side there, you're seeing that um, besides this knowledge in STEM, uh, they're gaining all these things that used to be called soft skills. They've called it 21st century skills. But it's, it's all the things on, on how do you work well with others, uh, the communication gains, uh, how do you resolve conflicts, because surprisingly you get more than one person in a room deciding how to build a robot, not everyone's going to want to build it the same way. Um, there's going to be competition, which means there is a, a, a very hard and firm deadline when the robot's got to be working, so you've got to work on time management things, there's going to be all kinds of problems, so all of these things they are working on because the robot brought them into it as far as the interest. And so those are some real key metrics, I think, beyond what you think about when you think about let's let's have the kids build robots. Let's go next. All right. And so uh, first, like I said, it's got a continuum of programs. And every year uh, the games follow around a theme and they've gotten better over the years since I've been engaged. And so now there is a common theme. Some of that is because some of the major partners with FIRST include things uh, like um, uh, the Vegas promoters, uh, it's, I've just gone blank, uh, Circus Circus, or not Circus Circus, that's the casino, uh, Cirque du Soleil, there we go, that was the one I wanted, and uh, Disney Pixar. So here we go, first launch. Uh, this is the current 
theme uh, with games. Who can go next? Uh, the the little bitty kids, age six through ten, kinder through third. Uh, they're doing Mission to Moon, uh, the first Lego leagues. They're playing on game tables that all have to do with Into Orbit, and you can kind of see there what's going on. The 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 junior kids. We'll look at them in a minute. They're just kind of doing a research piece. The the Lego kids. They're doing the research piece and building a robot. And then when you get the first check challenge, which we'll talk about a lot today, our game, uh, Rover Ruckus. Uh, and these were all last year because I grabbed this from last year. And then uh, Deep Space was last year. All right, next. My apologies for not being current on that. So here we go. Uh, first Lego League Junior. As you can see, uh, you're looking at about six kids. You don't want to get a whole lot of kindergartners and, and first and second graders into room trying to coordinate all that. So the team size is limited to six. And it's really working on just starting that discussion and pathway as they go through there. They, it has Lego in the name. And so you're going to be using uh, some of the, the primary grade kits, not building a full robot. Basically, you're looking at a mechanical piece, but really, it's the research journey. And so next, um, there's going to be a challenge in a the model. They're going to create basically a show me poster. Uh, if you want to think of this as kind of like an alternative science engineering fair, they're going to look at the challenge. They're going to go on a, on a journey and find some things out, talk to experts. And so we will have an expo where they will put their poster and then they will also require to have built some sort of mechanical device with the motor that operates it. And uh, there are no judges. Uh, reviewers come around and look at these things and we have not an award party, we have a celebration thing where we, uh, we talk about all the teams and the things that they've learned and celebrate that. So let's go next. First Lego League there, you can kind of see uh, the kit. Maybe many of you are familiar with the Lego Mindstorm kit that came out of the MIT Media Lab in the early 80s and 90s. Uh, it's gone through a couple generations now. The current one is the EV3. Um, teams here are still a little bit restricted to size 10 because uh, it's a box of Legos, uh, a really fancy box of Legos, and they're doing the research piece in addition to that. Uh, and so, there wouldn't be enough things for all those hands to do again. So team size is limited to 10. You're building the robot out of the Legos, which means once you've made that initial investment in the kit, uh, you're good to go. Although you might want to buy some expansion kits and things like that, but uh, it is reusable year to year because you're not cutting, drilling, screwing, taping, and gluing, all those kinds of things. Let's go next. All right, and so, like I said, they're gonna be building a robot. They're gonna put it on a game table that's about four feet by eight feet, basically a standard sheet of plywood. And there will be different ways that they can score points. They're going to go into the judge room and present their robot. And then they're also gonna go into a separate judge room at tournament and talk about their research journey and their problem. And so um, their problem should be within the game thing but it should be within their community. And so they're trying to solve something in their local area, however you define local. Uh, and so once again, they're problem solving, they're being judged on communication skills, how they attack things, how they communicate and all those kinds of things. Next. All right, uh, the topic really of today is then the first tech challenge. This is gonna be most of what then the high schools would be competing in um, unless you've, got larger spaces and bigger budgets to do the first robotics competition. Here again, team size can be 10. Uh, you can go above that if you wanted to because the robots are a little bit bigger. Uh, you can have students working on other facets as well. You'll see a picture there of a really simple kit based. Um, there are a couple vendors that are selling robotics kits and our parts. The, the picture there, maybe you're, if you're really good, you're spying that there's a Lego brain on there. That is not current. In fact, that is even not the current uh, Lego brain. That is an old NXT, not the EV3. The control system for First Tech Challenge is actually now, for the last couple of years, been uh, Android devices, meaning that there is a select number of Android phones that you use. And so there's a phone on the robot, and then there's a phone uh, at the driver stations where the students are driving. And so the processing power is just incredible. Um, if you've listened to any conversations or, or 
TED Talks and things like that, how much technology is now in the palm of your hand and your smartphone. And so uh, obviously the smartphone is not set up to drive a robot. So there is another piece of uh, electronics that the phone plugs into, but, but the phone on the robot is the, is the actual processor, the Snapdragon processor that's running things. Uh, let's look, next slide. And so in this level of competition now, instead of putting your robot that's been pre-programmed onto a game table, this is now head to head, right? And so the game field is uh, approximately 12 feet by 12 feet. It has got uh, a foam tile mat in there. And then the game elements change every year to fit within the, the game thing. Uh, the, this slide show that I pulled is from last year. It was talking about Rover Ruckus. We had uh, a piece of uh, game element in the center that simulated a landing craft and the robots were attached to it, would lower down and then drive all on the mats and collect uh, different minerals, uh, wiffle balls and plastic cubes and things like that. And so um, this is head to head. And not only is it head to head where you have a red alliance and a blue alliance playing, but it's actually teams of robots. It's 2v2. So at a, at a tournament, uh, you are going to be randomly paired into the match uh, schedule software. And in one match, you will have a partner school and you'll be playing against two other teams. And then a couple matches later, that team that was your partner in that first match may now be on the opposing alliance. And so it is uh, 2v2 in a round robin thing. And um, this is where we get into some of the things that, that we're gonna talk about in that, that first is more than robots, but let me just finish out this slide. So um, there are going to be winners and losers based on points on matches. The, the students uh, build and program the robots. I, I talk about that the students are driving them, but for the first uh, part of the match, usually 30 seconds, uh, the students do not have their hands on the controllers. The robots are, are driving around on a pre-programmed or autonomous uh, program. And then after that 30 seconds, then there's uh, a five second pause when then they, they pick up their controller and they then start driving around and trying to score points. And usually the, the last part of that uh, tele-operated where they're driving it portion, there is um, some last few seconds of the game where there is now um, special opportunities to where you can only do these things at the end of the match uh, to try and gain uh, the last few points and secure the win. So it's talking there in the middle there about a reusable platform powered by Android technology. And so in that previous slide, um, you saw that there seemed to be like a metal based kit and the, the major vendor for the, the basic kit of parts has been uh, Tetrix uh, by Pitsco. Uh, but there have been kits that have put together by uh, first has been around long enough that there are people that have graduated as alumni at first gone to college, gotten jobs and decided to create their own business of creating uh, robot parts and things for educational technology. So uh, Rev is uh, the company that started from some alumni and they actually are the supplier of that module that the, Android phone connects to, but then they also have robot parts. So uh, Rev Robotics, which is based in Dallas and has staff in Austin, uh, puts together a, a kit that you can use. And then there's other companies uh, because the robotic enthusiast hobbyist community has gotten large enough out of the Colorado area, somewhere out there, there's Servo City slash Actobotics Go Build It. It's, uh, that's one group of people and they've got like three flavors or three brands. And so um, those platforms are reusable. And then uh, another vendor in this is also then some retired engineers from Chief Delphi up in the Detroit area that started, uh, and it's called, uh, those were Andy Baker and Mark Coors. And so that one's called Andy Mark. And so there are, there are many suppliers and platforms that you can look at. Uh, obviously there are some rules uh, that surround those as to the types of motors and things you can do. And since you're programming in the Android environment, all the apps in that area are programmed in Java. And there is a, a nice kind of stepping stone between Java and if you're familiar with the Lego environment where you're putting icons on a screen, which is kind of running kind of like a, a LabVIEW 
kind of thing with the Mindstorms program. Blockly is that to where they're actually, there's a block for a motor, a block for a sensor, and you kind of link those together and work on flow. Uh, the interesting about the Blockly is you can do that all on the robot uh, through the phone. You don't actually have to have a laptop. Uh, there's some challenges to doing that, but then it's kind of an easier entry point uh, for you, so you don't have to be doing Java. But if you are working the Java, you are actually working in the Java development environment that anyone develops an application for an Android phone, and that is Android Studio. And so it is full-blown Android Studio that we've got our students working in here at Lutheran High School. Um, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot to learn. Uh, but there's a lot of resources and um, a, a custom set library that has a lot of the, done of the big hefting. And so we just pull in the functions uh, and those of you that speak the, the language, we do includes or imports or calls. And we can then just send the parameters and say, yeah, I wanna move the motor for five minutes or 30 seconds or whatever. And so we can just call that function and give it the parameters for how long or how fast or how far. And then so that it's, it's learning, it's a challenge, but you're not having to invent the entire wheel, just pieces of the wheel. And so um, the last two bullets, I think we hit the last one already where the $80 million scholarships. Um, I wanna talk about the next, the last bullet there where we're talking at the competition. And this gets into where we were talking earlier, or I mentioned earlier, that it's it's more than robots. It's this, not just about the building the robots. It's we got to get all those soft skills. And so, how do you um, incentivize teams to really be working on those soft skills or 21st century skills? How do you get the teams to be the agents of change? You do that by the number one award, the highest award, the first way that you advance out of your local tournament on to the next level tournament all the way through the world championship tournament is not by whether or not you won on the game field. That's the second way that you advance. If you are the captain of the winning alliance, that's the second team that advances. The first team that advances is the team that has done well enough on the competition field, but also is doing all the other things. Do they have the design process well documented in the engineering notebook? How did they come up with their design step by step? What are they doing in their community to inspire others to go into the STEM fields? So you will see teams that are posting on their social media and doing things like we went out to this elementary school or we held uh, a STEM night and invited community members in. We're going out to organizations and doing things like that. Are you also connecting with STEM professionals? Have you visited a university engineering lab? Do you go to engineering professional societies or have mentors and things like that? So there's different outreach and connects things. And so the highest award is the team that does well in all of those things and that's our uh, Inspire Award winner, but then there are lesser awards for just doing well in the design category, doing well in your programming, doing well in the outreach and connect. And the advancement alternates between judge awards and how you do on the game field. And it always starts with the judge award and then second is game field and then next the judge award and then third or fourth now on game field. So it is in the vernacular of first, it's more than just robots. Next. Um, this is uh, numbers for last season and you can see uh, there's about 6,818 teams. I will tell you that 650, almost 10% of those teams are in the state of Texas. All right, Texas has historically for the last five, six seasons, been about 10% of all first tech talent teams in North America. And um, you can see that uh, this is a well-developed uh, program has been going on since 2006. It had a couple of years of pilots. And so it's uh, over a decade now, a uh, decade plus that this has been around and that, that curve is growing. And so I, I don't want to say uh, that you are late to the party, uh, but the, there's a lot of people here doing this. And um, if you're not doing it yet, I, my advice is that you should give it very serious thought about jumping in on this thing um, as it continues to grow. Let's go next. 
Uh, so this is the hardest fun ever you'll have is a, is a key thing is that the students um, are really going to engage in this. You will see them coming in on Saturdays to work on this or staying after school until 5.30, 6 o'clock working on this. Uh, there's been some times uh, in some seasons when I've had students um, that have stayed, you know, eight, nine o'clock at night uh, just to work on this thing because uh, they want their robot to work well and compete well. And so it is a lot of work, uh, but then they're enjoying themselves uh, as well. Um, maybe you're not ready to, to jump in just yet with your team and students. And so my advice would be there's still a little bit of the season left in terms of what's happening. Uh, just last weekend, Dina was uh, in the Waco area for another one of her job duties. And I don't know if she made it over or if the event was going on, but the, the league tournament just occurred in Waco. Uh, there are events still happening all over the state of Texas this weekend. They're in Austin, San Antonio, um, the Rio Grande Valley, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Lubbock, El Paso. Um, we're trying to get something going again out in Abilene. And so what you're seeing at this part of the season are some of those um, which you would maybe call district, uh, what we call league level events culminating. And then the winners or people advancing from that are going to next level events, which are likely an area or regional championships. Uh, the one here in central part of Texas is happening February 22nd and 23rd. And so what I'm telling you is that um, you could take some students and go watch one of those, but if you really want to get the look and feel for it, um, you should volunteer. Now that's a little bit shameless plug and that, that's what I started off saying that a lot of my job is trying to uh, plug into different sources uh, to get people to, at these events to help pull them off. Um, but honest and for true, um, being a volunteer at an event, your engagement level is much more high and you're actually going to learn some of the inside things and you're going to be talking to other stem professionals uh, business people in your community that have that have found that this is a worthwhile thing that they're giving up their time and so it is an opportunity for you to begin on your networking as well so uh, just a whole lot of pluses there so um, you can reach out to vina she can plug me in uh, wherever. You can also go to some websites like First in Texas to find out when events are. And if you just send a short little email to whoever that event contact is, they will welcome you with open arms and plug you into any role. And there's even roles for students to be doing. Um, and the other opportunity that, that being at events and volunteering is, is many of the major donors also then have some of their key people there. and so. Um, I don't think there's any private or parochial school anywhere in the world that would say, no, I just don't need to connect with people that are donating money to other causes that I want to be involved in. So uh, there's just lots of good opportunities for you to, to become involved, either jumping in with a team right now or jumping in as a volunteer uh, and an absolute minimum, uh, just attending an event. All events are free and open to the public. Let's see where we are at next. All right, so here's uh, a not well-kept secret. Uh, first understands that um, getting started is really hard in terms of the amount of learning that goes on. And so the season kicks off like I, in September, late August, right around Labor Day. And so you've kind of, you know, I told you the season's kind of getting close to the postseason now and world championships will be in Houston again in April, uh, but if the season kicks off in April, I mean, in, in August, September, and then you've got like, you know, October, November, December, when you're, when you're competing, that's, that's a really short window to try and learn things. So what they've done the last four or five years now is what they call jumpstart. And there's, there's a link on this slide, you can click on it uh, at some point. And what they do is if you start a team, if you actually register a team before March 1st, and you pay that $275 annual dues to be a team. Um, you know, your robot kit's gonna cost five, six, seven hundred dollars 
that will be reusable except in case the, kid, the kids uh, tear it apart or, or cut things or modify. But if you register a team before March 1st and pay that 275 and buy your kit, they are going to credit you that 275 annual due when the new registration opens up the following season. So basically, you're getting to start now and able to buy the kit and start practicing and building and testing things out in March, April, May before the next school year starts and you'd have to learn a whole lot. So it allows you to, to learn a few things and you're thinking, and so the, the reason they're giving that, that 275 credit is so that you can, without being a first tech challenge team, you can't buy that control hub and things like that. You maybe could buy a robot kit, but it wouldn't be the one that you would be competing with. So you pay the 275 now, buy all your equipment, the kids can start learning and doing things. And then that, credit is sitting in your first account so that next year's season dues are going to be paid automatically. Now, if you like are a, a serial QVC TV shopper type person, you're always looking for a better deal. First in Texas um, gets a lot of funding from different organizations. One of them is the Texas Workforce Commission. There are un applied for rookie grants that have not yet been awarded this year. I'm gonna say the number's 15 or 12. I, I'm not on the grant committee, so I don't know the current status. You could apply for a rookie grant this year that would cover that $275 and also cover the parts, the, you know, the kit of parts. So, you know, it's a good $750,000. I don't know the total amount. And then if you, so if you do that now, then that 275 that you're paying, it's not even your 275, it's grant, and then it's being credited for the next year. So, um, and this is a jump start. So you would still then be classified as a rookie for next year and could qualify for a rookie grant uh, next year. So it's almost a twofer and you get to get started now and learn things about that. So um, just incredible opportunity for you. And you're like, well, where is the tech? How do I find that? Um, we've got that on a slide as well. So um, let's pause for a moment uh, before we bring in uh, a couple of my students. And uh, I'll ask them, the, the moderators if there's any questions uh, that I need to address at this point. We don't have any questions so far. Let's see if anybody drops one into the next couple of seconds. Why don't you go ahead and get set up with your kids? And All right. So uh, I'm going to bite the students uh, in perfect timing uh, because some of them just got back from their lunch. So I told them to be here at two and they're, they're right on time. So uh, here at Lutheran High School, uh, we're about, I don't know, our, our population varies from 150 to 160 in terms of enrollment for uh, ninth grade through 12th grade. Um, and so out of that 150, we normally field uh, two teams, and this is now our third year, uh, where we have uh, a varsity boys and a varsity girls. Uh, and we started the varsity girls, and we, we gave them the hashtag no boys allowed. And so um, I wanted to invite them to kind of give uh, their perspective because um, I'm, I'm, my credibility is, is jaded because I'm, I'm a teacher and I'm an organizer and things like that. And there is data that I shared, but I wanted uh, you folks at the other end to kind of hear some of what, what students are saying uh, about that. And so I've got here in the room with me, uh, Colin Levine. He's a 10th grader here at Lutheran High School. And he came from uh, one of our schools that we consider a feeder school. And he was uh, a participant on their first Lego League team. And so he'll talk a little bit about um, progressing from first Lego League in middle school to now being on the first Tech Challenge team at high school. And then I've also asked Paige Riley. She is a junior. Um, she's also like uh, on our cheer team and girls softball team. And uh, we got her as a 10th grader and we threw her into robotics right away. And so this is her second year on the No Boys Allowed team. And um, I'll let them do rock, paper, scissors as to who wants to talk first. And um, maybe three or four minutes each on just, you know, what their experience is uh, and, you know, how first is kind of changed some of their their life here in high school and what they're thinking about doing more. So 
Marcelo. Lean a little closer to the mic. If you're using a built-in mic, we can't hear you. So, like Mr. Schutze said, I started in first robotics in seventh grade in first Lego league. And in ninth grade, I transitioned into first tech challenge. And in that, I learned valuable engineering skills, like how to make 3D models and then transitioning those 3D models into making parts for the robot on mill and 3D printing parts, as well as laser cutting them. And I also learned how to program in Java. And aside from that, uh, I also learned how to work together on a team and cooperate with other teams. And I learned valuable presentation skills and how to present to career professionals in the engineering field at universities and businesses. And it's also legal uh, for you to start with just a, a standard piece of aluminum profile and, and make your own part yes. or uh, design it and I'm it sure I'm not hearing that anymore. Or you could have it designed in a pretty line printer. So it is not required that you make your own part. We uh, but you can using a speed printer and Andrew, if you're using a headset, uh, switching between people, or if you're using a built-in mic, try to get closer to it because you're cutting in and out. All right, we'll work on that. So, hi, I'm Paige. I'm I'm currently a junior here. I joined the team two years ago, and being on the team for two years has taught me a lot of things. Last year, it taught me how to take orders, I guess, from someone like a boss and how to do them properly and just do them in the best way possible. As the leader this year, I've learned organization skills on how to set up something that the whole team can just understand and that moves smoothly throughout the season. The organization skills and lead to planning for the future, uh, such as uh, for the first meet, we want to do this. The second meet, we want to do this. Third meet, we want to do this. And then by the end of the season, we want to have all of this done. It's taught me how to use tools such as the laser printer, the mill, a bunch of different things that I can use later in life. Cooperation skills, working with a bunch of different people on the boys team, on my team, and other teams in our league. And it's taught me public speaking. I become a much better speaker in public or to the judges and it's just helped me grow as a speaker. All right, so uh, my apology for some of the audio there, um, trying to work them in. And so just from those two things, you heard about the, the students talking about uh, different hard skills that, they, that they've learned on, on building and modifying parts. And maybe what you didn't hear is it's, um, We've been doing this uh, for about a decade here at Lutheran High School. I've been here for five years. And so we've kind of built up some of the tooling that we have, uh, but it is not required that you start out with uh, lots and lots of different tools. Uh, but maybe you've got a, a maker space and have a, a 3D printer in there as well. So other things that you heard from the is that um, we're trying to do the full program. And so they've gone out and on uh, a regular basis presented to uh, college students in teacher education classes here this afternoon we're going to make one more connect trip and head out to a local uh, engineering firm uh, tour their facility and then talk about our robot so um, Paige really didn't have a whole lot of choice to become better at her speaking skills because we're putting them in front of uh, different groups of people and they're you know apprehensive at first 
but then what they find out is that the, the people are really interested in what they're doing, asking lots of questions, uh, and it's it's very empowering for them to be looked at uh, by adults or peers or younger kids as having some knowledge and sharing things that other people want to learn about. And so that's some of the, the secrets of our credits first. All right, um, where are we? I think we've got the slide with some links. That would be next. And so firstinspires.org, that will take you to the main site for first, and you will see the entire continuum program, the first leg of leaflet technology, first of all competition. That's where you would uh, start your team and uh, create your profile. You can apply for grants there as well. This is where you would find the different resources that I mentioned before on the programming. And through that dashboard is where you would order your kit of parts. It's also through that dashboard on your uh, team account where you can also find events and sign up to volunteer. The second link is for First in Texas. Uh, that's all run together and that's also a dot org. And that's got a calendar of events just in Texas, and it also has the grants page uh, where, like I mentioned, there is some number, uh, less than 20, of rookie grants still available that you can apply for. You do have to have at least a temporary team number. So when you create your first account until you actually pay the 275, uh, you don't have an official team number. You've got uh, some temporary number with a bunch of digits. Um, and so you can use that temporary number to apply for the grant. And then if you are awarded the grant, use that grant money then to pay uh, your registration fee and things like that. And then there's also a, an 800 number there that you can call as well. So I think I've kind of run through most of my slides. And so maybe Vina's gonna pick up now and talk maybe about how this works with TAPS. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing with our TAPS schools, TAPS robotics coaches, more about FIRST and about FTC. And uh, thank you, Paige and Colin, for sharing your experiences as a student and how it's helped you to grow uh, personally and also um, help your teams out. Uh, let's talk about the TAPS 2020 Championship. We will host our event at the Waco Convention Center on Monday, March 30th. So this is a little bit earlier than it has been in the past. We're trying to keep in um, up with the FTC season that's already going on, um, but then also we are joining this with our speech and debate and academics event and our art event that's happening. So over uh, the, the Monday that robotics is happening, our speech team and debate teams will also be on the campus starting our academics championship. And then the next two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, the rest of the academic teams will join us as well as our art program students. So we definitely are in store for three exciting full days. Um, and I'm looking forward to our robotics team starting off that week with a lot of enthusiasm. So who can come to this TAPS championship? Uh, it is open to our TAPS member school FTC teams, as well as any of our TAPS member school feeder schools. So some of our schools are uh, K through 12 or 7 through 12, and some of them are only 9 through 12. So if you're a 9 through 12 school and you do have an FTC team that comes from your feeder school, they can also uh, come to our championship. The cost is $100 per team. So uh, if you have like with um, Lutheran um, High, they have a boys team and a girls, no girls allowed team. Those, uh, it's just $100 per team. There is not a a school registration fee or an event fee that you have to pay in advance. I know we did that one year, but uh, this year it's just uh, 100 per team and it's payable at the event. Uh, the registration for telling me your team number and who's on your roster and things like that is uh, due March 9th. So we still have some time for you to uh, decide to come. But also if you're interested in starting a Jumpstart team this year, uh, you can go ahead and do the Jumpstart program, buy your kit, and although it's really geared for you to learn it for next year, what better way to go ahead and get it and see if you can put a robot together before March 30th. Um, you know, last year we did have one team that came and they had a robot and when they showed up they said, well, we can't do anything, our robot doesn't work. And I will tell you, I was super amazed to see other teams come over to their table and help them and troubleshoot and, oh, you need this part, I have it. 
and the teams just really came together to help this team and they had a working robot and it was really awesome to see the camaraderie from the other teams and it's not just about that one team and their experience but the other teams from the other schools just joining together to help them have another team to compete with um, the instructions for registration will be posted on our website um, at a later date um, but I'll, I'll get that information sent out to you um, with the uh, the robot season just kind of think of what what do we have to do to prepare for this we will be doing the same ftc challenge this year uh, with the sky stone uh, season game that uh, presented by qualcomm that you are competing with your regular ftc season so you bring the same game and uh, compete what with what you're doing already this school year um, uh, some, uh, Andrew, uh, you can answer this question, but one of the questions was uh, some of the North Texas teams are able to use um, a specific game controller. Is that going to be available for um, all the teams? And so if you could answer that question, uh, that would be great. Sure, so um, someone is eligible there on, on the on the participants list. And so I mentioned that Rev Robotics is the, the supplier of the control system on the robot that the Android phones plug into. And what's been in development and now has been piloted in a couple areas, North Texas being one of those areas, is a control system that doesn't need the Android phone on the robot. Uh, they still need the Android phone in the driver station where the students are driving. Um, and so uh, basically, that removes uh, one piece of electronics and invents in another. And so the those teams that are in those pilots are advancing through the first tech challenge program through all the way up to the first world if, if they do well enough. And so there is then a mix in areas of teams that have the pilot uh, new control piece and those that don't. And so uh, first has already decided that it is okay for teams to be competing with either the pilot hardware or the existing hardware. And so uh, at the TAPS event, we're just going to continue uh, play along in that same vein. And um, if that pilot hardware becomes available for teams to use, um, then you would certainly be able to buy it and put it on your robot. Um, the, the reason that we're not asking teams from like the North Texas area to take it off is because um, they would then have to then find place on the robot to put the phone back on it. They never built a phone place for it. So um, it would be an undue burden for them to try and, and do that. And first is already means that you could be competing with the pilot hardware or the existing hardware. So um, we're just gonna play it just like the, the first school is doing. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, so uh, with with our TAPS championship, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about how it how it will mimic the robotics, the FTC events. Um, the past couple of years, we did not do classroom judging where the teams would go to a panel. We have just done the uh, pit judging, uh, but basically it runs the same way. We will start the morning with a registration time and you can set up your pits. Um, there'll be a field inspection, just like the regular FTC event. Um, and then we will start the morning with matches. And then um, after, I think we try to get five matches in per team. After that, we'll have a tournament of two different, uh, the Alliance groups. Uh, we'll have their tournament. Last year, we had enough teams to have uh, where you chose two alliance partners. And so it was a, um, we had two different groups going on, groups of three teams. And um, that was really great. I do believe this year, we're going to try to do the judging in the, the, the pre-judging where the teams will go to a panel of judges. Um, with that, we do need volunteers for this event. So uh, making sure that your team is registered is one thing, but then also get your parents involved. Um, and then also you as coaches, we will have a link on our website on how to volunteer and uh, the actual volunteer registration. 
as well as the instructions for registering your team. We'll update our website in the next week or so with that information. Um, as far as the judged awards, we do have some awards that we have specific to TAPS and that are not the same as the FTC. We do a Spirit of TAPS Award, and that is um, that goes along with our TAPS mission um, for leadership, fellowship, fair play, and sportsmanship. We have a, a Strategic Thinking Award that it best reflects the journey of your season, the kids going through their obstacles and creating and the way that they've had to think through um, their strategies and understanding the engineering process. We do have a robot design award that will demonstrate the design principles, striking a balance between form and function as well as aesthetics. And then an innovation award where it um, talks about, the, uh, it awards the team uh, innovated element and then their solution to the game and then how it actually consists, if it performed their design brought to reality. So um, we want to award that those teams for that bringing concept to reality. And then we also have one award that is a little bit different. It's called a Rockstar Rookie Award, and it celebrates the teams that have been competing for less than two seasons, um, just how they have a unique effort and um, it you know, teams that identify what more about their future and their sustainable goals, not just how they're competing this year, um, but um, an opportunity to award those rookie teams. So we do follow the FTC game. So this, the Skystone for, for this season, we'll use that. And then um, for the most part, the day will look like a regular FTC event. Um, all that can be found on our taps.biz website. Now we, the main page at the top will have different links, but the main thing you'll, you'll need to know is we have athletics with all our sports and then we have everything else falls under fine arts. So when you go to taps.biz, just click the fine arts link and then that will take you to our fine arts page where there's another link for robotics. Um, if you have questions, you can email those to info at taps.biz and then that will um, come to me and we can sort out if this is a first question or someone on a, ro a robotics coach may assist me with answering the technical questions. But if you send them in to info at taps.biz, we can make sure that we answer those questions or feel free to call our office at the number you see there. Okay, we are out of time. Um, I see a couple questions that are pretty detailed in here, and I don't know that we'd be able to answer them adequately. So if you have any questions that we've not gotten to, would you please send an email to info at taps.biz, and we will get those forwarded on to Andrew um, so he can help you with some of that information. Um, thank you, everybody, for being um, part of the webinar today. Again, we're going to have a recording uh, up on our YouTube page, and you're going to get an email from GoToWebinar after the fact. Uh, all these links will be posted on the TAPS website uh, under the robotics section in the fine arts uh, area. Um, one more thing, if your robotics team has a Twitter account, has that social media presence, look us up, TAPS Robotics. Um, we don't know who to follow right now. We, we, I, I can't find a list of, of robotics teams out there. So if your school is into, uh, is into this or if your team has a has a social media presence, uh, give us a follow so we can see what's going on and, and share some of that content with the rest of the community. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Vina. Um, and with that, I think we're going to close it down. You folks have a good afternoon.